Okay, thank you for being here today and, and thank you for um, choosing this session. I know that there's a lot of good ones to select from and so I hope that you'll learn something today that's useful and helpful. Um, to begin with, my name is Marlene Graff and I teach at Utah State University in Logan. My um, area is nutrition, dietetics, and food sciences. So I'm actually a registered dietitian, but then I returned to education about 15 years ago, and that's where I've been ever since. So um, one thing that might be obvious so far is that I'm a bit of a rebel. So when they sent out the, the um, slides to use in this conference, I thought, well, I like green better than orange, so I changed them. So I hope that's okay. But let me start with a little quote that I think kind of captures my teaching philosophy in most cases. And that's that we're all teachers and we're all students. And so during this presentation, I, um, I really hope that you will be willing to share from your own experience and provide some additional insights because I'm not the expert. Uh, I, I'm just here to share some ideas. And I think that all of us have things that we can contribute as we go. So let's start with an objective. Uh, basically in a nutshell, my objective today is just to share some ideas that will spark ideas for you. And so I'll talk about some things that I've tried this year. Uh, some of them have worked better than others, but I hope that by the end of this session, you'll have at least one thing that you feel is practical and feasible and doable and something that can be effective in your course. And so after we um, go through some of these things, like I just want you to marinate on it and think about how you can adapt it to a course that you teach. Um, I will say, however, that probably like most people, uh, this year has been a challenging one for me. Um, in fact, I think it's probably been harder to be a teacher this year uh, than it ever has before for me. This year has felt harder than my first year of teaching. And so I'll just start with this disclaimer, that when I say effective, that doesn't mean perfect or polished or pretty. Um, in fact, it was kind of a, uh, yeah, day by day experiment on what was gonna work. And so um, I'm sure that some of you can maybe relate to that. Also, another thing, I, I'm not sure, well, I can't promise that implementing any of these things will result in spectacular course evaluations at the end. And I can't say that mine were fantastic as a, re as a result of uh, implementing some of these things, but I felt like I stayed in the black at least. And um, so that's why I'm here today to, to contribute and uh, share what worked for me. The other thing to keep in mind is that what works for one person doesn't work for everyone. And what is good for one class isn't good for every class. And there's also more than one right way to do something. That was uh, some advice that my dad gave me when I was married. And I think that's the best advice he could have given me at that point. I was, uh, I got married later in life. And so by that time, both my husband and I were pretty set in our ways. And so it, it uh, required some adjustments uh, in those first few years on learning that, yeah, his way can work sometimes and my way can work sometimes. And sometimes we can create a new way that works even better. So I hope that uh, you'll be open to that as we, as we move along today. So I'm gonna try to um, kind of model how, how I implemented some ideas in this course and then how I adapted them and changed them to fit another course. So this course is a general nutrition course uh, it's a, it's one that's intended for all majors and fall semester, I had 400 students in that class, give or take. Um, we converted it to a fully online and asynchronous format. 
Prior to that, it was being taught as a blended course and it included an in-class and in-person element. And so I kind of felt like I was building a whole new course um, with this class last semester. So then also I teach this course in the spring and I'm comparing the two because they're both nutrition courses and they, they are both relatively large enrollment. This class is a little bit more focused um, and it's meant for students who are majoring in dietetics or nutrition science or another health related major. Uh, it has 82 students, so about a fourth of um, what's in my big class. And then the format for this class is web broadcast. So we meet weekly over Zoom in a synchronous setting and um, talk about the course. So last year, um, in fact, I was at this conference last year and I presented at this conference last year. And that happened just days before uh, our university and many other universities went fully online. And so like I'm feeling a little bit uh, maybe nostalgic today because I, like uh, this conference is one of my last concrete memories of when things were quote unquote normal. But for this class last year, when, uh, when we made that quick conversion to a fully online setting, uh, it, it felt really challenging. Part of that is because this class has a lab component to it. And I, I just didn't feel like uh, we did that lab very well fully online. And so that's why I made it web broadcast this semester. So let's talk about how um, I implemented four things in both of those classes. And by the way, you're welcome to stop me at any point or ask questions. I'll try to save some time at, at the end as well. But it's fine if you interrupt um, as we go. So the first thing I wanna talk about is participation options and how that worked for me. Uh, basically that meant offering options to students on what assignments they selected, but also offering options on how they submitted or turned in uh, an assignment. So participation options are a way to encourage students to persist and to stay motivated and to um, continue to, to push on in a course. Then we'll talk about Kaltura video quizzes. So our learning management system is Canvas and Kaltura is kind of part of that. And so that's why I was using Kaltura rather than something else. But I use these as a way to help students navigate online and become familiar with our course and the content in our course. And then number three, we'll talk about Kahoot challenges. My guess is that most of you are familiar with Kahoot. It's kind of a, a quiz game that resides outside of our learning management system, but it's a fun way to assess understanding and progress. And then the fourth thing that we'll talk about is some pro tip videos. And these are videos from students in the course that I had reached out to and invited to share test taking tips and study strategies. And then I posted those in our learning management system for other students in our class to view. So that became a way to build an inclusive learning community and help students get to know each other. So let's start with participation options. Is there anyone who'd like to read this quote? I, I can do it. Go ahead, Lynn. Online learning offers nearly infinite flexibility. And this flexibility is particularly valuable now that most college students in the United States no longer fit the traditional mode of living on campus and studying full time without caregiving responsibilities or a full time job to do. Would you agree? Have you seen this? Yeah. Uh, this quote is from uh, Michelle Miller, who teaches at Northern Arizona University. And throughout this presentation, I'll be using uh, quotes from her to kind of um, illustrate some key points for, for each of these four things. So flexibility definitely is a key element, especially in an online course and during a, a period of time where we're dealing with a pandemic. So one thing that I tried in my course 
last semester that I haven't uh, fully explored before was what I called participation options. And so in, in my course, I had you know, exams and assignments and other things accounted for. But then I added participation as 10% of their grade. And my reason for doing that is I wanted them to engage with our class and to um, get on Canvas often and to stay caught up and to interact with me and other students. And so what I did is that this is a snapshot from, from the assignment page in Canvas. And they had a total score for participation points. But down here, they had a list of several options, things that they could kind of pick and choose. It was kind of buffet style. So each of those options was worth 10 points. And they could choose any combination. And the goal was to, add, to reach 100 points by the end of the semester. And so, for example, uh, here were some week one activities to help them become familiar with the course. And they were, you know, pretty low stakes, uh, doable assignments. But if they missed one of these things, they could still make it up by doing other things. Another reason why I added this list is because there, I wanted students to be able to identify um, tools that worked for them well and, and things that didn't and uh, kind of put them in the driver's seat. So one of the things that I had on there were digital escape rooms. And I actually presented on that last year. But basically, it's just um, kind of a, a quiz uh, outside of the learning management system using Google Forms. And so for a lot of students, they liked that, but not every student loved digital escape rooms. And so if they didn't want to do a digital escape room, they could choose another option for learning content. Um, so that worked pretty well because uh, once again, I had a lot of students and they represented a variety of different uh, disciplines and also learning preferences. And so I think having some options help them. There, there were some drawbacks to this also, and we'll talk about that more. But here's another example of an assignment in this course where uh, they, they had some options to choose from. And so, for example, on, on this page, they had four options to choose that would fulfill the requirements for this assignment. And they just had to pick one. Also, they could have some say in what they read or watched or listened to to kind of become familiar with the content. And then when they actually submitted it on Canvas, they got to choose whether or not they wanted to type a written response or to do a, a video recording talking about them, how they've done that assignment and what they had learned. So why do we offer options? Well, first of all, let's talk about maybe some pros and cons to providing more than one participation option or more than one way to engage and um, turn in assignments. Any thoughts? And this I would think that they choose the easiest options. Okay, that's a good point, Lynn. So yes, yeah, sometimes they might be inclined to choose the path of least resistance. As an instructor, that was kind of um, something that I really looked at so that every um, option required about the same amount of time and effort. And so like my, my objective was to just create different ways for doing the same amount of work. And that got a little bit challenging. So that was kind of uh, maybe one drawback. Let's see, there's some comments in the, the chat. Yeah, diverse art audiences are more likely to participate. I think maybe it can be a way to be more inclusive. Oh, how did you keep track of grading them? That's a good question, Elizabeth. My um, strategy for that was in our learning management system on the assignment page. I made this section worth 0% of the grade. And then on a weekly basis, sometimes more often, I would download scores and I would um, uh, I'd add up a cumulative score on an Excel file 
And then that cumulative score or total score was the one that factored into their grade. So, so these showed up as being worth points on Canvas, but not contributing to their grade until it was added into the total score. Does that make sense? So, yeah, did you, did you yeah, yeah take end. a little bit of. of did that. you add those in? So you kept track of them separately and then at the end. Point oh, that's another question. Did students get flustered with seeing assignments on their to-do list if they didn't have to do them all? Yeah, that, that, that did happen in the beginning. That was kind of one of the drawbacks. And so like that took some um, uh, just regular communication about that. Um, and, and kind of also labeling so that they knew which things were participation options and which ones were required assignments. Um, Jamie asks, is there anything that prevents them from completing all or most of their participation points in the first week or two of the course? Yes, for some of these, like I, I staggered the start dates. So for example, on this digital escape room, they couldn't begin it until we were to the unit that talked about macronutrients. And so even though this was an online asynchronous course, then they were fo still following a schedule and doing things by unit. But it was possible for them to work ahead of schedule if they wanted or to catch up as needed with participation options. Um, did it bother students that they couldn't have a high score for participation early in the semester? Oh, so did it to pull down their overall grade? That's another thing to uh, mention. So I adjusted this total score as we went. So for the first few weeks, I said, uh, right now, the total points possible for participation is 20 points because that's about where I'm expecting you to be. And there were some students who were a little bit higher than that at that point in time, but some students who were a little bit lower. And so it was mostly a conversation of seeing this is a, you know, a really variable score. So uh, if you're working ahead, don't get too comfortable. And if you're catching up, there's still uh, time to, to do well. So why did I implement options? Well, I feel like there's some good research to demonstrate that giving students options helps them to feel more uh, involved in their learning and also makes them feel more motivated to complete things in a way that uh, makes sense to them and kind of aligns with their learning style and preferences. I thought this um, was interesting. In a 2010 study, uh, they said that when students received a choice of home homework, they reported higher intrinsic motivation to do homework. They felt more confident regarding the homework and they performed better on the unit test compared to students who didn't have a choice. I think this was for a high school audience, this particular study, but um, I think it also applies to a college audience. Yeah. Another thing I liked, this is from Jim Bentley, who teaches at the Buck Institute of Education. He says that student choice also redefines the position of the teacher from a knowledge expert to a learning guy. And I think that's important, especially in uh, college classroom. So how did I adapt this to the course that I'm teaching now? One of the things I did was I simplified it more because I have fewer students and also those students are kind of in an area of focus. So they're all kind of um, in a health related major. The other um, drawback or one drawback, I guess, to offering a lot of participation options was for some students that got a little, little bit confusing where they felt like there were too many options and uh, they weren't quite sure uh, what one to pick or uh, another thing that became an issue for some students is when I called them participation options. Some students uh, felt like all participation options were optional and didn't contribute to their grade. And so for some, like, they had to catch up later on because they didn't understand that in the beginning. So I still do provide multiple ways to turn in an assignment. Uh, for this particular one, uh, th this is kind of a low stakes assignment and it's just a reflection assignment. 
where they're watching a, a recorded lecture. And then they can send me a copy of their written notes or typed notes, or they can respond to some questions um, in either a written format on Canvas or in a video response. So that's it for that section. Any other questions about participation options? Once they reached 100 points, then they were done. And so I kind of gave them a, a baseline or a um, target. And then they uh, had enough time to kind of see what worked for them and what didn't. Even once they reached 100 points, um, there were some students who continued to do participation options, especially if they realized at that point that they were, it was helping them on exams and assignments and other things. So let's do Kaltura video quizzes as a way to help students navigate online. Uh, anyone want to read this quote? Sure, I'll do that. Thanks, Derek. Faculty who teach online need to be creative and need to have a deep understanding of how learning works, as well as subject matter expertise in order to make a course truly come alive for learners. Great. So that can be a little daunting, especially when you are building a course kind of on the fly or, or in a less than ideal semester. Uh, last semester, um, I, I spent a lot of time making videos and it was a little bit disheartening to me to see how many students were not watching all the videos. And that got kind of frustrating at times. But I think one of the mistakes I made is that I had the video on one page and then the assessment for the video in another place on campus. And even though I had you know, provided a link in the instructions that says, watch this video, um, that didn't always happen. And so um, what I started to do was, um, as we got into the course content, I started creating more Kaltura videos or more Kaltura video quizzes as a way to get them to actually watch the video and take the quiz at the same time. And so here's how that worked. Um, when they opened up a Kaltura video quiz, there were some instructions and there was also uh, this, this button to start the, the video quiz. And so when they pushed the play button, their first message was, welcome, in this video you'll be given a quiz and all the questions need to be answered and the quiz will be submitted at the end. So when they hit the continue button, then it started. There was an option in the top corner for them to download a preview of all of the questions on the quiz, which I thought was a nice feature. So they kind of had um, an idea of what they were gonna be asked and what the video would cover. Once they started, then down here at the bottom, there were numbers indicating at what points a question would pop up. And so one thing that some students did was they would just click through the questions instead of watching the full video. And maybe that, that was okay because if they could do well on the questions without uh, listening to the full video, then maybe that's all right. And I think a lot of them discovered that the questions were challenging enough that they needed to watch the video to be able to answer them. When they got to a question, they had the option to skip it or to go back and to uh, kind of rewind and listen to um, the earlier part of the lecture. And then once they selected an option, then they had another chance to either change their answer or select that one. And then uh, when, when they finished all the questions, then there was an option to review the questions and change them if needed or to submit it. And for Kaltura quizzes, they got one chance uh, to take the quiz. They had that review option, but after that they couldn't uh, take the quiz again. And so once it was submitted, they could see the answers that they got wrong and see why, or at least what the correct answer was. And then um, the score went to their Canvas gradebook. So, any pros or cons to this method that you can see? Maybe you've tried a, a Kaltura video quiz. I'd 
Are the experience been? Are, ahead, ben. are you able to um, use the find questions for a Kaltura quiz? So if you have a question banks built in Canvas, it'll draw from those question banks? There might be a way to do that, but when I built this, uh, it wasn't, um, well, I, I didn't see that option. And so that was one uh, challenge for me was that I felt like I was kind of limited to only 10 questions in this case, rather than having a bank that could randomly draw. And so, yeah, that was kind of a drawback. Yeah, and somebody in the chat said, no, you can't do that. Okay, that's good to know. It wasn't just me that was not finding that. Um, any pros to this method, do you think? I think students will find it more interactive. Yeah, the percentage of students who were at least engaging with the video went up. I don't know that that the they all watched the full video, but they at least saw that it was there and it wasn't just hidden on another page. So that was nice. Uh, let me just quickly show you how I adapted that uh, this semester in the course I'm teaching now. I do still do videos, um, but I use, a, um, I use a program called Loom, which is kind of like Screencast-O-Matic. And so I just let those videos reside outside of our learning management system. It's possible to um, upload them to Canvas and have them right there and, and embed them like I did uh, last semester. But that process was also pretty time consuming and it required me to be on campus to have a strong enough connection so that it was uh, quick enough. So with Loom, they can go to this website and there's all these emojis at the bottom where they can interact with the presentation as they watch it. It also keeps track of how many students have watched it. And sometimes they, there's anonymous viewers. Sometimes they add their name and so they can see what other students in the course have found interesting. Um, plus there's a video link that it will show and this is the link that I add to Canvas. And to me, it kind of makes things a little more clean and condensed. Um, although in some cases, students are maybe less likely to watch a video if they just see a link instead of a little picture. Uh, the other thing is what I've built kind of um, regular quizzes again within Canvas, but I've, I've added links to the videos within that quiz. So this allows me to still use my question banks and provide more than one uh, attempt on quizzes and then questions change with each attempt. So uh, there's been some uh, advantages to that one. Can you turn a Kaltura video into a Loom video? I don't know if you can go backwards, but I do know that you can turn a Loom video or you can embed a Loom video into a learning management system. So I haven't tried the opposite way though. Um, did you have issues with grades passing from Kaltura quizzes to the Canvas gradebook? Uh, no, that was really seamless and pretty automatic. Uh, I guess the only thing was that sometimes students didn't realize that a score had been submitted and that they uh, were getting credit for that. So let's um, move on to Kahoot challenges because I'm looking at the time and I uh, want to show you this option also. Would someone read this quote? I can do that. Thanks, Marie. Students are reeling from the disruption to their educational and personal lives. And so faculty find themselves needing to provide more support and more flexibility than they ever have before. Right, so sometimes that felt pretty heavy. And, and yet, um, I think one of my reasons for doing Kahoot challenges was to kind of lighten things a little bit, make it fun and game-based and kind of break up um, the, the, the heavy lifting, I guess, in, in the course. So for Kahoot challenges, I, I created them on the Kahoot website. I just used the free version. 
And then once I created a, a challenge, then I would link it in uh, Canvas and I'd add the pin number. So the cool thing about Kahoot challenges is that they can be done asynchronously. And you can link them open for a window of time. And then students can go in as, um, as their schedule allows. And then it keeps track of you know, the winners. And so once the challenge ends and it shows you the podium with the, with the students who were at the top. Also from uh, the instructor view in Kahoot, you can go in and see reports from the challenges and see how many players participated, what the average score was, who the, the, um, the high score students were. Anyway, it's kind of a fun way to break things up. Here's a link over here on how to set up a Kahoot challenge game and how to make that uh, asynchronous so that they can participate um, in a fully online course. Hey, Marlene, I hate to interrupt right now, but I just wanted to um, give a reminder that we have about five minutes left. Okay, thanks so much. So pros and cons to this one, I think maybe the fact that it resided in a place outside of Canvas uh, maybe caused some students to miss it. The other thing is not all students entered their, their name or a name that I recognized, so they didn't always get credit for doing that. This semester, since we have a synchronous uh, meeting time, I just went back to Jeopardy, good old Jeopardy, and I, I think a, a Kahoot challenge would still work for this class, but uh, Jeopardy has some advantages too. So let me end with the pro tip videos. And I use this as a way to build an inclusive learning community. Here's our last quote. Does anyone want to read that? I will. I read that, Marlene. Thanks, Emin. Experts agree that power of online learning doesn't come from the content itself, but rather from the active engagement students have with that content, with the faculty and with one another. Yeah, so my experience has been that one, that um, the more intentional you are about building a community, the more naturally learning flows from there. And that's hard to do, especially in a large enrollment online course. And like I said, it didn't happen perfectly. But my objective is always to build um, connections between myself and students, but also peer-to-peer -peer connections um, between classmates and then a connection with the student and the content that we're learning. So here's how I made this work. Um, in, in my gen ed course, um, for the last several years, I reached out to students who are doing really well in our course after the first exam. So they're, they're landing somewhere in the top 10%. And I, I invite them to submit some of their study strategies or test taking tips and um, ask if I can post a picture of them on our learning management system. And so that's worked pretty well in the past. I've always linked it to a PDF copy where they've just typed out some suggestions. This year, I had them do videos, and they could do a video either on their phone or using Kaltura or or, um, or a program like Loom. And so I, you know, provided some instructions and an example. All of their videos were less than five minutes long, but um, they agreed to let me post a picture of them and also a link to their video on on Canvas and. I think this was my favorite thing last semester because uh, I could see that they were learning and connecting with each other. The other thing is I felt like when they heard the same advice and study tips from a peer rather than me, they just seemed more willing to, to do it. And uh, a side benefit to this was the students who I'd identified as top students almost seemed to try even harder to kind of uh, do well in the class so that they can kind of maintain that status. Pros and cons, this took some time and logistically it uh, uh, had to be organized. 
this semester I did this instead. I just kind of made a table based off of um, a survey that I had given at the beginning of our class. And so this is things, where are you from? And what's your birthday? What are four favorite things? Three hobbies, um, two words to describe you, and then a favorite quote. And then I added pictures, the colors indicate what their major is. And so I think this is working pretty well now, and yet I don't think I'll do this in the future, at least for a course this big, because it was really time consuming. And when students dropped or added, then I had to fix this page. So that was a bit challenging, but I think it has helped us start building a learning community. So, Let's see, someone asks, oh, you have to go, all right. I'll, let me just end with a, this quote from our keynote speaker. In his book, he talked about how, how he'd written the manuscript for this book, and it was you know, in the process of being published uh, prior to when COVID-19 kind of shut everything down. And then, so in his preface, he says, he talks about how he had 10 days to convert his courses into a fully online format and he'd never taught online before. He said, much to my surprise, I found the exploration of these new teaching practices invigorating. I had been curious about online teaching for several years, wondering how it would compare to the traditional classroom experience. Some of the teaching practices I experimented with in my online course proved very effective for my students. And I will continue to use them when I return to face-to-face. -face. Uh, instruction. I suspect many traditional high school and college courses, the kind that meet in physical classrooms filled with human bodies, will undergo a similar transformation in the post-pandemic world. And that's kind of my um, prediction also. So I hope that um, some of the things that you're implementing now will stick and be things that you can continue to use in the future. I'm thankful for you joining me and staying two extra minutes. I hope you found something useful today. Awesome. Thank you, Marlene. Um, we are going to just have everyone hop off now and head to the next session. But thank you. That was a great presentation. Thanks, everyone.